Number 20, unreasonable results. An advertisement claims that an 800 kilogram car is aided by its 20 kilogram flywheel, which can accelerate the car from rest to a speed of 30 meters per second. The flywheel is a disc with a 0.15 meter radius. Letter A, calculate the angular velocity the flywheel must have if 95% of its rotational energy is used to get the car up to speed. All right. Um, so first thing is that they're asking us for angular velocity, right? And they're telling us this other term of rotational energy. So I start thinking to myself, do I know a way that these two variables are connected, you know, formulaically? And I do, right? I, I know that they're connected this way, okay? The kinetic energy due to rotation or the rotational energy that is, is equal to one half multiplied by the moment of inertia multiplied then by the angular velocity squared. So... Now thinking about this, remember also the conservation of energy, right? Energy isn't created or destroyed, it's just transferred. So the rot the energy the car has once it gets up to speed, meaning the kinetic energy the car has once it gets up to speed, came from where? Well, it came from the rotational energy produced by the flywheel. All right, that's how the vehicle works. So we can say something like this. We can say that the kinetic energy that the car has should equal the kinetic energy of rotation due to the flywheel. Now, this in and of itself is true. However, there is another condition, right? It says that, it says calculate the angular velocity the flywheel must have if 95% of its rotational energy is used to get the car up to speed. So what does that sound like? Which side of this equation should be greater than the other, given the nature of how this section reads. Well, it sounds like whatever rotational energy is being produced, only 95% of it will be then used for production of kinetic energy in the car, right? So it sounds to me like this total amount of energy that's available over here should be less than the kinetic energy produced by the rotating flywheel right? Because only 95% of that energy from the flywheel is used up by the car. So what that means is that we can then plug in our percent on or on which side of the equation, the left or the right? What do you think? We would plug it in on the right-hand side, okay? Why on the right-hand side? Because remember, we just said that this side, this value has to be greater than this value. And therefore, this thing should equal less than what is here currently. What that means is if I plug in a 0.95 on this side, we have now that the kinetic energy the car achieves is less than this value because if this were 100 units, you'd take 100 units, multiply it by 95%, and you get 95. So this total side would then be 95. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, this being set up, now I can start substituting some stuff in, right? I mean, we now can start breaking this up, right? Remember, that's just kinetic energy, linear kinetic energy, one half m mass of the car, since we're talking about the car, multiplied by the velocity of the car squared, will equal then the rotational value. So now it's uh, one half the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular velocity squared. That whole thing multiplied by... 0.95, okay? Um, so now we are being asked to find angular velocity, so now our job is to solve for this thing, right? Omega. So we can simplify a couple of things already, right? We can cancel these halves on out, and then we can now just rearrange some of the terms, okay? So omega now, and this is just doing some algebra. So omega should be now equal to, it looks like we're gonna have mc vc squared, all divided by then I or 0 0.95 times the moment of inertia. And that whole thing has to be square rooted because we have to find omega, not omega squared. So this is then the formula. And what that means is now I can, you know, I can expand on the I, right? The moment of inertia told us that the flywheel is like a disc. So here's the formula for the moment of inertia. Okay, you can basically just take this on in. Uh, put, I'll put this on in, mr squared over 2 for there. All I'm going to do is I'm going to start plugging in the values, but I will do that formula here. 
So the mass of the car they told us was 800 kilograms. The velocity was 30 once it reaches speed squared, divided then by uh, 0 0.95, multiplied by then the uh, moment of inertia. So that moment of inertia is the mass of the flywheel, because we're talking about the flywheel. This is the thing that's rotating. The car is moving linearly, so don't confuse them. It's the flywheel that we're interested in. 20, then uh, multiplied by the radius, 0.15 squared, and that whole thing then divided by 2. And let's just calculate the value. We've got 800 times 30 squared, divided then by, parenthesis, 0.95 times 20 times 20, times 0.15 squared, all divided by 2, close the parenthesis, and then square root it. So here we get a value of about, so omega is 1 point, uh, I'll leave it in, I won't convert into scientific, probably three sig figs are good, so 1,840, okay? And that is in radians per, radians per second. So that is the angular velocity. That takes care of letter A. Now letter B, it says, uh, what is unreasonable about this result? Um, now this, so for letter B, I mean, this is a tremendously large rotational velocity that it experiences. I mean, you know, how many, how many revolutions per minute is this? You can do that conversion if you want. It, it, it's a significant amount, I mean, um, you could also calculate, if you wanted, you could calculate centripetal acceleration of it, you know, of, of the edge, on the edge of the disk here. Um, if we wanted to do that, basically what we'd have to do is uh, remember that centripetal acceleration is equal to uh, tangential velocity all divided by r. Also remember that tangential velocity is equal to r omega. So basically, and by the way, this thing is squared. Don't forget that, like I just did. So, well, I didn't really because I remembered it now, but I forgot it initially. So we'll just say I forgot it. So now we can do this and take this and plug it on in. So it's centripetal acceleration is equal to r omega squared all divided by r. Obviously, we have a common r. So it's just r omega squared. Now, plug in your values, right? We have the radius here. We also have the, uh, the rotational uh, velocity. So if we take 0.15, multiply it by 1840 squared, just using rounded numbers here, it's not a big deal. The centripetal acceleration then becomes, you know, 500,000 or so. You know, in terms of G, if you were to take that and divide it by 9.8, I mean, you're looking at basically very similar value of about 50,000 Gs. I mean, that's insane. Okay, this is way, 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 way too, too great. Okay, that's in meters per second squared. So there's a couple of ways you can you can look this through why it's unreasonable. Lastly, which premise is unreasonable? Most likely the moment of inertia. You know, meaning that the this this diameter, excuse me, the radius is probably way too tiny. All right, making you know if you look at the math over here, making this larger would then make the overall denominator larger, but by a factor of squaring it, and then this denominator gets larger. That means this whole value gets smaller. Right, so we would then be decreasing this, making it a little more reasonable. That's my answer. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Please remember to subscribe. Look forward to helping you with the next question. Take care.